Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles. Would you please open them to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. We're going to pick up where we left off last time in verse 18. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18, in a Bible study that I've entitled, You Have Come to the Mountain of Grace. You Have Come to the Mountain of Grace. Now, it's true that there is collateral damage when people choose sin. Like, you never sin just to yourself. It affects others. There's collateral damage. There are always other people hurt by your sin. It's not just you. It's like throwing a rock into a calm pond. When you throw a rock, the ripples of the rock hitting the water just continue out, continue out, continue out, continue out, continue out. There's always collateral damage. I would say that all of the pain in this room, everything that we're all going through collectively and individually, is the collateral damage of original sin dating back to the Garden of Eden and the ripple effects of what sin has produced over the years, over the generations. We live in a sin-soaked culture, an antichrist culture, We live in a world that does not honor the one true God. And because of that, so many living apart from God, making so many sinful choices, we pay the price for other people's sinful choices. But we also pay the price for our own sinful choices. And we add, unfortunately, to the collateral damage in other people's lives. Nobody ever sins unto themselves. It always affects others. Depending on the level of influence God has entrusted to you, some of you affect more people than others. Sin is painful. And also the choice for believers to stop running their race, turning away from the Lord, that too has collateral damage. That's sinful. And it hurts when we see men and women, young boys and girls perhaps, just choose to quit and no longer run a run, want, no want, <laughs> let's say it right, no longer want to run their race. Just saying it's enough, I'm done. Sometimes choosing the world, sometimes choosing atheism, who knows what the choice is. The great temptation that the Hebrews were facing was to turn away from Messiah, to turn away from the Lord. It's a great temptation for many today. Now, let's be clear in the context and the direct interpretation of Hebrews that the Hebrew believers in the first century were being tempted to go back to the old covenant. And we'll see that unfold in the text today. They were tempted to leave the fullness of their freedom they found in the grace of God and go back to a system of religion. That is not the biggest temptation in the room today for us as we fast forward 2,000 years. Now, of course, there may be some among us that like a religious formalism and want to go back to religion, but that's not the biggest temptation. There are other temptations that are more pressing in the room today. Temptations to leave the pure, true gospel of Jesus Christ to something else. And it's possible that even as you leave the true gospel of Jesus Christ to something else, that you still continue to call it the gospel where you stop running your race and you stop pressing in, but you've adopted something that you've labeled the gospel or that you've labeled Christianity that actually isn't the gospel or Christianity at all. And that has certainly been a temptation in our culture in recent months. To adopt other causes and elevate them above the gospel has collateral damage even as noble as they might be, to somehow create a hybrid of politics and call it Christianity, that's not from the Lord. To elevate a, and they even have a phrase for it, to call it social, the, the social gospel. There's no such thing as the social gospel. The gospel is social. And you can take these things and as have your cause and say, this is what I want to do. And then you call it the gospel, but you never mention the gospel at all. And that has collateral damage, church. So you say, well, wait a minute, Ed. I, I want to be political. I want to see social change. I want to see racial reconciliation. I want to see these things. So does the Lord. You have the heart of God. He wants to see people changed and cared for. He wants the homeless fed. 
He wants babies saved in the womb. He wants righteous and godly leaders in government. You're right. You're with him, but not before the gospel. The gospel comes first. Jesus made it clear. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Oh, don't misunderstand me. I do not believe the gospel will make you less socially conscious. I believe it'll make you more. I don't believe the gospel will make you less racially concerned. I believe it'll make you more. I don't believe the gospel will cause you to not be involved in politics. I think it'll make you care more who leads in government. But this hybrid of running after things and calling it the gospel has collateral damage. It damages the witness of the church. It takes away the focus on the cross and the redemption of Jesus Christ. And if the Hebrews were to go back to the old covenant, it would do the same thing. As they go back and take things into their own hands, because remember the Hebrews were losing things. In order to to follow Jesus Christ in the first century, the Hebrew believers literally lost everything. They, they lost their status in society. They lost their position of employment. They lost perhaps even their home and their community. They, they lost their influence. They lost their family. They lost their finances. It was a large commitment. You could say a whole commitment to follow Jesus Christ in the first century. We just don't experience the gospel like that today. Perhaps more and more in the coming days, perhaps more and more pressure, more and more challenges as different political parties or changes take place, whatever. Whatever happens, the Lord's going to be with us. He's going to have, we don't have to think the best and hope the, we don't have to hope, be like, oh, be so afraid of what's going to happen. The Bible says that he has put hope in our hearts and we can hope the best. That's what agape love does. We hope the best. We know that God is with us. But if we allow anything to take precedent over the gospel, I'm just telling you, it's going to have collateral damage in your life. It's going to affect us as a church. God has placed this church and that church and the one around the corner, every true church, to bring effective change to people. You know, Jesus, when he came to die, he died for one reason. And he died for one thing. At least you could say one thing at a time. He died for your soul, for you, individually. How how do families change? God saves a person. How do communities change? A changed family lives in that community. How, How do cities change? How do states change? How do nations change? One believer at a time. One at a time. And you say, okay, Ed, okay, I get it, all that. So what's the gospel then? Well, let me make it clear for you in case anyone ever tries to share with you a different gospel. Let me show you. Hold your place in Hebrew and Hebrews and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because you're right. You're reading Hebrews and you're like, I'm not tempted to go back to the old covenant. Well, some may be. People out on television in different places want to bring you back to the law, to the Torah. They want to bring you under the old covenant. Some of you may be tempted that way. But most of you are tempted in other ways. Most of us are tempted in other ways, and it's not always addictions, and it's not always drugs, and it's not only the top five sins of life. There are a lot of things that tempt us to quit our race and say, I'm done running with the gospel. I want to run this way, or I don't want to run at all. So here's the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, notice with me, couldn't be clearer, and everything comes from the gospel to the gospel and through the gospel for the believer. This is your new identity. This is your new purpose in life as a born-again believer. A singular purpose, you could say. This is where it starts. Verse 3. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And you add, what do you mean? How is that the gospel? Look at verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you. This is the gospel. Jesus lived, died, and rose again. And that message, embracing your God, if you embrace Jesus Christ, believing that message, you too will be born again, and you will be saved, and God will change your life. I guarantee it, based on the authority of God's word. That's the only way that change can take place. And I said it in the earlier service, I think it needs to be said here. 
Politics is not the gospel. Nowhere in the Bible will you find that. Now, I realize some people may be upset with me, and I'm willing to take that. Go ahead and write to me the 15-page, 20-page article on how you disagree with me. Write it to me, send it to me. Lay it in it with scripture. Make sure you're there in context. And when I see your email and I read the first line and I see it was you, I'll just forward it to Ian, and I'll let him read it. <laughs> or whatever pastor's on my mind at the time. I realize, it's, I, I realize it comes in conflict with some, some folks, but I, I challenge you to read the Bible. I challenge you to let the Bible speak to you. I'm not telling you not to be involved in the political realm at all. You would be mischaracterizing what I'm saying here. I believe that if God's called you to be active in the political realm, absolutely you must do that. You have no other choice. You must be compelled to obey God. And I think we should all be involved in the political realm to some degree, whatever God degree God has given to us. But if you hold up some political view as the gospel, you are wrong. Because the gospel is plain and simple. Jesus lived, he died, and he rose again. And that, it's like, I always like to look at it this way, and especially those of you that might wear contacts, but with glasses, you know, even your contacts. If you chose, if I, if I chose to say, if I, if I, I liken my glasses to the gospel. When I put them on, I can't see you without seeing you through the gospel. My definition of you is the definition that God has for you. I can't help but see you. Now, I take my glasses off. I could put any glasses on. If I put the glasses of this on, then I see you that way. I put the glasses of that on, I see you that way. If I don't have glasses at all, I don't see you at all. That's the way it is. But when I put the gospel on, then I can't help but see you through the eyes of Jesus. I can't help have compassion on you. I can't help, to wanna, I can't help but want to help you and serve you and love you. Why? Because I see you the way that the Lord sees you. And I won't demonize you. And I won't say just because, you, you know, when you walk in love, you even love the people you disagree with. You love the people that maybe don't like you. You love the people that maybe come against you. You love the people, like, love conquers. It's the love of God. Are you guys with me, church? Are you with me? It's okay to say amen if you don't agree with me. If you don't agree with me, that's okay. I love you anyway. And we're just going to grow in grace together. That's the beauty of the church. We don't have to agree about every single thing. But I, I say this. Test what I say. Test what you hear. Hold fast to what is good. Test all things. But hold fast to what is good. Because if God can stir us all in love and good works, we will make an even bigger difference for our community than we have in the last 21 years. And it's God's heart for us to do that. It's God's heart for us to be socially minded. It's God's heart for us to help the homeless. It's God's heart for us to help the orphan and the widow. It's God's heart for us to serve this community, to give generously, to, to self-sacrifice. And could it be what God was teaching us in 2020 is for us to learn how to sacrifice, how to die to ourselves so we can be a better impact on our community? I think so. I think so. I've learned a lot about my flesh in 2020. I hope you have. Not about my flesh, but about your flesh. I hope you have. Just coming up against it and just really, ugh, just, I can't tell you how many times I just like, oh, that's about all I can say about it. It's like, oh, it's like that. I guess the word is angst. But the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Ever. And that's where these guys are. Different reason. But they're in the same place. They're just thinking, this I don't want to run this race. It's too hard. It's too painful. It's too difficult. And I don't want to run anymore. For them, they were tempted toward legalism and formalism. But you and I, we may be tempted in different ways. And for them and for us, the answer is the same. Don't quit. Run your race. Endure. Persevere. In the, by the grace of God, you will make it. So what does he say here in verse 18 with that in mind? For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire and blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure what was commanded. 
And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. This is after Paul said in, in chapter 12, hey, those are people who are weak around you, people ready to quit. They got feeble knees, hanging down arms, go along and help them and strengthen them. And, and then it's almost like Paul saying in these paragraphs, you want to go backwards? Do you understand what going backward actually means? Do you remember the time, he says, of Moses when he received the Ten Commandments? Do you remember how holy God presented himself? Remember how hard it was for them? It was so terrifying and so hard and so difficult that it says right here in the text, the people begged for God not to talk to them. I mean, you're in a place now where you have Messiah, you have freedom, you have forgiveness, and you want to go back? to a time where it was so difficult and so hard and so scary. There was nobody representing God except for Moses. And even Moses was afraid of God. You want to go back there? Do you want to go back to a time when there was no one speaking on your behalf? Do you want to go back to a time when it was hard and challenging? Where blackness, that's a time that's described by blackness, darkness, storms. There was a distance between man and God that nobody could cross. You know, like then, even now, God is holy and man is not. Because if man could be holy on his own, he wouldn't need to give the Ten Commandments, but he did. And this whole paragraph is like, remember Moses, and then he asks the question, do you really want to go back? Are you sure you want to go back to the law? Are you sure you want to quit? Are you sure you want to stop running your race? And that's the word of God to you today. Are you sure you want to quit? Are you sure you want to run away? Are you sure you want to be distracted? Because that is not going to be a good choice for you. Uh, as I say often with my kids, seeing the decision they make, just letting you know, you know, I don't think that's going to end very well. You keep on that. I don't think it's going to end very well. Uh, I don't think you're going to get what you're expecting. I don't think that you're going to accomplish what you desire by that series of decisions, but they're not my decisions to make. That's what God's saying. I don't think it's going to end very well if you choose to quit. I know it's hard, and I expect it'll get harder. Harder, difficulty. I was just talking to a brother yesterday, and we were talking about situations. I've adopted a new phrase, as I've seen it in my own life. You know, there's pain upon pain, and things become harder than hard. And that's how I choose to express some of the difficulties I've faced in my life, especially in the last seven years, even recently. It's just harder than hard. But God is faithful. So you could be harder than hard, than harder than hard. And God's going to still be faithful. You're still going to be able to make it. Why? By the grace of God. By his strength and his goodness. Hey, you're still going to make it because God loves you. And he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. And Jesus Christ was brutally murdered for his kindness and love. He was buried, but he rose again three days. And he's alive right now, inviting you into a relationship with him. That's how much God loves you. He sent his only begotten son for you. And that hasn't changed. He loves you and wants you to be in relationship with him. And, and so do you want to go backwards, believer? I hope not. But even if you do, listen, there's a contrast now in verse 22. He says, it's not like then. He says, but you, and that word of contrast, you, and I want you to mark this if you like to write in your Bibles. It says, you have come. It doesn't say you might come. It doesn't say one day you will come. He says, born again believer, this is where you are right now. This moment, as I speak, you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God and to the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus. You have come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, to the blood of the sprinkling, what speaks better things even of that of Abel. You have come. This is where you are. This is a spiritual thing. This isn't physical Mount Zion. Although when those of you that will be coming to Israel with us in November will take you, will be on Mount Zion physically. This is not physically. It's spiritually. These are all spiritual things. You, you are in a position of grace. You've come to the Mount of Zion. Why? By the grace of God. You're not at the mount. You weren't with Moses. You're in a different time. You're in the new covenant. You, you are there right now. I mean, and look at how it's described. 
not blackness, darkness, and storms. It's described as, in verse 22, the city of the living God. Remember, Abraham was looking for that city whose builder and maker is God. You've come to the heavenly Jerusalem. You've come to an innumerable company of angels that worship God day and night and serve him. Verse 23, you've come to a general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. You're with all believers of every generation that have loved God and served him. And you've made it to, you're there, you're right there. And notice it says, you are registered. Then it made me think, you know, here we are, you have to register to be at church. And you think you're going to get rid of registration? You got to register to get into heaven. I got the same response every service. A lot less this one. It is dumb. You won't have to register in heaven. You know what it is? You know what it's referring to? It's much better. It means your name is written in the book of life. By the blood of Jesus, you're already registered every single time. And it's so good to know that your names are written in the book of life. And that's how you get in. It's not by your good deeds and not by all your good works. It's by God's grace. You want to leave God's grace and go back to, go back to a, a place of fear and torment and uncertainty and lack of clarity of who God is? No. He describes it, notice, about this new covenant, the blood that sprinkles. It's the final sprinkling of blood that's better than even the blood crying out with Cain and Abel and the situation in their family. We're looking to God of this festival gathering, joy unspeakable, full of glory. Heaven is coming for us. We can look forward to it. But more than anything, better than heaven, better than the city, better than all this is verse 24. You've come to Jesus. And he's described here as the mediator. The go-between is what that word means. The one that stands between you and God. Would you turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 2? This is so important. Especially for those of you that have come out of a religious church or a man-made religion like Roman Catholicism, this is very important for you to understand what the Bible teaches. Because unfortunately, in that system of religion, some were taught, I mean, anyone in that system is taught wrong. And maybe some of you were taught wrong. Because you were taught, and, and it's still very much uh, approved today, that you have more than one mediator. That, that you can go through saints to get to God. And that even to get to Mary, you've, I mean, get to Jesus, you've got to go through his mom, Mary. But the Bible doesn't teach that. It's not true. It's man-made. And look at what the Bible has to say, because you want to see it for yourself. And I'm going to quiz you on it, so study hard, all right? Study hard. Verse, verse 5, chapter 2 of 1 Timothy. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Pop quiz. How many mediators are there between you and God? Are you sure about that? There's not two, not three, not four. There is one mediator between you and God. Who is he? Jesus Christ. That settles it. You don't ever go through Mary or a priest or a saint or a pastor or a church or a mentor to get to God. You have direct access to God through faith in Jesus Christ. He is your mediator. He stands in the gap and pleads your case as the accuser of the brethren comes. And as maybe the devil himself or other people make false accusations, Jesus stands in the gap and he protects and takes care of you. He speaks the truth. When accusations come, you can almost hear Jesus say, nope, she's mine. Nope, he's mine. Nope, that's not true. And he pleads for us. There's only one mediator, church. Only Jesus said and validated, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Remember at Jesus' baptism, the Father spoke from heaven, and what did he say? This is my beloved Son. Hear him. Pay attention to him. He's the one, the final voice. The Bible says that Jesus came and embodied God in human flesh. He said, if you want to know the Father, know me. Because if you know me, you know the Father. The Word, the Bible says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He embodies for us in physical form the attributes of God. 
And we as the body of Christ have the privilege of being dwelt by the Holy Spirit to manifest the attributes of God as they point to Jesus Christ. You have access to, you can come to him directly, specifically. I know from time to time people get frustrated here, here in this little church, because, you know, we, we have, I think we have 12, 13 pastors that, that serve here on staff. Some work full-time uh, here on the church, and a couple of them have other full-time jobs, and they're serving. We also have countless hundreds of lay leaders, men and women here, that have positions of spiritual leadership. And from time to time, we will get feedback that maybe someone didn't get back to them on time. They called in desperation and left a message and didn't know the office was closed. Or maybe a pastor was on vacation and didn't forward his voicemail. There's a thousand different reasons why that happens. But people get frustrated because a pastor didn't get back to them. But part of that frustration should be eliminated because while you might be waiting for a pastor to call, you should call upon the Lord immediately and he will answer you. He is your help. Now, don't misunderstand me. I train the guys here. Hey, answer your phone calls right away. Answer your text message and email. So there is a part of it where that could be our responsibility. And I, we accept that responsibility and even ask for your forgiveness if it's ever happened to you. Not in any way dismissing our responsibility. However, if your desperation leads you to run to a man first, you will be disappointed. Because even just this week, this week I had, I had to be home this week, so I took a lot of phone calls, took a lot of things, didn't have meetings, I had a lot of phone calls. So in my phone calls, I was talking to various people and somebody laid something on me where my answer to them was, they said very much, Ed, what am I supposed to do? And my answer was, I don't know. I don't know what you're supposed to do. Let's pray. Because I believe God can show you what he wants you to do, but I just don't know. I don't have a word of wisdom. I don't have any direction. I've never experienced this before. I don't know. And you know, as men and women that serve together, we don't know everything. And our desperation, our desperation could lead us to disappointment if our desperation doesn't lead us to Jesus. Our desperation. Need. And you go, well, Ed, how do I do that? How do I call upon him? Just, just, just take your Bible and open it and begin to read it. You go, but Ed, I'm, I, opened, I did that. I told you, you told me to do that last week and I did that. I opened to Leviticus and I'm like, oh man. Okay, so if you open to Leviticus, go somewhere else. <laughs> like the idea of, of going to the Bible, it, you're not going to the Bible looking for an answer. You're going to the Bible looking for God. He's got the answer. This isn't like a manual, although we call it a manual and it's got great wisdom in it. It is a book written to you by a God that loves you. And as you draw near to God, the Bible says, he will draw near to you. That's a promise. And he will answer your questions. And, and perhaps as pastors, we can too. But the answer is, no matter what we say, no matter where we are in the word, the answer will be the Lord. We have to point you to the Lord. I know that frustrates people, but don't be frustrated by it. Any pastor that always points you to the Lord is a good pastor. That's a good man, a good woman to have in your life. She's always pointing you to the Lord. You want that. As much as you may not want, you want that. A godly sister, a godly brother pointing you to the Lord. And here is here is Paul telling young Timothy, but also telling the Hebrew, you want to quit, you want to run, you got to run to the mediator. That's where you have a mediator. You're not alone. You're not running this race alone. I know people are falling to the left, falling to the right, but you have a mediator. You have a mediator. Cling to him. Look to him. Trust him. Hold fast to him. He's going to stand in the gap for you. Notice what he did. It says in Timothy, it says in verse 6, he gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. He gave himself. That's very precise language. Only Jesus Christ, the eternal son of God in human flesh, has the authority to give himself on behalf of you and me. His blood for your sin and mine. He gave himself. And then the word ransom, that speaks of us being hostages. And we were. We were hostages to sin and death. And Jesus paid the price of our ransom to release us. And that's what really the essence of Hebrews 12 here is saying. He says, you were in prison to sin and you've been released from it and you have freedom now in Jesus Christ and you want to give up all your freedom. And then you know what it's like. You know what it's like. You go, well, man, I've lost so much. It's been so hard. People hate me now. I lost my job. 
Nobody cares. I've got to, in some countries, I've got to worship underground. I've got to protect, like it's, I've lost so much. Yeah, yeah, I do want to go back because I want these things temporarily. And the Lord would just say, no, no, no. Like, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? What is a profit? It doesn't profit anything. So don't quit, church. That's the word of the Lord for you today. Don't quit. I know you're tired. I know it's hard. I know you might have been distracted a little bit. I know you might be frustrated. I know the angst level is super high right now. Don't quit. Come back. Remember you're at Mount Zion. You're looking forward to the city. The angels are surrounding you. You're enjoying the presence of God. Heaven is coming for you. Heaven is your eternal reward. You you can live at the kingdom of God here on earth as you pray to him and seek him. The good news is that we have a mediator. Remember Job? Remember Job? I remember as a new believer reading through the Bible and wondering why there was a book in the Bible titled Job. <laughs> Am I the only one? I, uh, as a new believer, hadn't read the Bible before, Job. No, his name is Job. That's his name. And Job was, as many scholars say, one of the first books of the Bible ever written. And Job if you're familiar with his story, was a story of pain upon pain and things harder than hard. He experienced true, true, deep, scarring, seething, traumatic pain in the loss of his children, in the loss of his possessions, in the loss of his prestige, in the loss of his reputation. He lost friends. You look at the story and you go, well, at least his wife didn't leave him, but his, he lost his wife in many ways as she was also grieving and going through it. And it was just a bad situation. And you, you're sitting there and you're like, man, Job, so much. And if you didn't know the end of the story, you'd just be grieving with him and hurting with him. And maybe you'd even agree with his friends because a couple of his friends show up, but they're not much of a help to him. They just start laying more guilt trips on him, more guilt trips on him, and they didn't help him at all. And there's a place in Job that he just feels so alone, I think, He feels so frustrated. He feels so just demoralized that he says something really powerful. Perhaps you found yourself in that very place. Listen, let me read it to you in Job chapter 9, verse 31. Probably something you didn't know was in the Bible. Listen to what he says. He's speaking to God and he says, Yet you will plunge me into the pit and my own clothes will abhor me. For he is not a man as I am that I might answer him and that we should go to court together. Nor is there any mediator between us who may lay his hand on us both. Job was in that place where he's like, I've got nobody to speak on my behalf. I don't have anything else to say, but I don't have anyone to answer for me. I don't have anyone to plead my case. I don't have anyone to connect. Like we need a mediator. And because we need a mediator, God gave us the one to plead on our behalf, to stand in the gap for us, to speak for us, to comfort us, to encourage us. And it's not a priest, and it's not a pastor, and it's not a Mar- it's not Mary, not a saint. Only Jesus Christ is the mediator. Church, how many mediators do you have between you and God? Just one. And I want you to leave here more in love with him than when you walked in. He is for you, not against you in Christ. He is for you. He loves you. Even on your worst day, God loves you, cares for you. And he gave himself as a ransom to deliver you from bondage. And that's what I want on your heart and mind before, as we enter into communion. So worship team comes up, I want you to consider the voice. Consider the voice. Remember in Hebrews chapter one, it says God in various ways, various times spoke to us through the prophets, but in these last days has spoken to us through his son. And part of our desire to stay in grace and to abide in Christ is to remember there's nothing for us backwards. Remember what Paul said, forgetting those things that are behind, but what? Pressing forward, onward, upward. Those are the words of progress of faith. The upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And I know it's challenging and hard, and I know it's going to be challenging and hard, but those things are what producing in us a true, pure faith you know, it's interesting. You have, you have two things. Uh, you have belief. So you believe a set of truths, but faith puts those in action. So you believe, 
but then faith puts it in action. And so God is saying, okay, all these beliefs, everything you believe about God, I want you to put them in action and step forward. Don't go backwards. Don't quit. So Father, we know that um, our hearts are knit together with yours. And, and even as we live in a very tumultuous time in our culture, God, we feel a loss at times. We feel like so much is out of our control. And uh, indeed it is. So we just pray for your comfort and your encouragement that we would not lose heart in well-doing, but in due season we'll reap if we don't lose heart. Lord, help us. I pray for those right now listening to me that have lost heart. They're so discouraged, so demoralized, so decimated, maybe by the ripples or the collateral damage of someone else's sin or maybe their own or a combination of it, God. And I just pray for your rescuing power to come among us. Rescue us, Lord. Strengthen us. Help us as we look to you. And as we're praying, if you're here today, you've never entered into a relationship with Jesus, that's my desire for you. I want to invite you to respond to the gospel. You guys watching online or listening on the radio right now, wherever you might be around the country, around the world, God loves you. He has a message of hope for you, and he invites you into relationship. He invites you to come through the one mediator, the one that will speak on your behalf, the one that gave his own life for your life, righteousness for unrighteousness, purity for impurity, sinlessness for sin. And he wants to be in a relationship with you. He wants you to live for him. So today, if that's you, I want to invite you. If you want to turn away, and, and you know, the criteria that Jesus said, if you want to follow him, is you repent. And I know it's a big Bible word, but it simply means to turn away, turn around. And today, if you want to turn away and turn around from your sin to follow Jesus, I want to invite you to do that. So if you're in the room and you say, Ed, that's me, would you just stand to your feet? Because we, we want to celebrate with you. Uh, we, this is a celebration time when somebody turns away from their sin to follow Jesus. So here in the room, it's not an unusual thing. It happens all the time. So you won't be unusual. It might feel unusual for you, but it's not. God's doing things all the time, saving people. So if you would, you can stand to your feet. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer so you can obey God. And of course, if you're not here or you're downstairs, I can't see you, but I would encourage you to have a similar response. Standing, um, perhaps you just need to get up and lay aside so your focus is right now. Maybe pull your car over to the side of the road and you say, I got saved right there on exit number at 125 on I-25 or whatever, wherever you might be. But God is calling you to himself right now here in this place. So I want to participate in that. And we want to participate in it. Is there anyone here that would say that's me? What a high and holy moment it really is. And I was thinking, you know, you'll get to take of the communion elements for the very first time in a real way where it means something to you. Like, that's pretty powerful. It's not just a religious experiment or experience. It's, a, it's really you stepping in. So let me say, for those that perhaps respond, I don't see, or not connect, you know, I don't see you. Let me, let me lead you in a prayer so we can obey what the Bible says, so you can confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. So you could say something like this, Dear God, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. I believe you sent Jesus Christ to live for me, to die for me, and I believe he rose again from the dead to save my soul. And I dedicate my life to following you, God, from this day forward. And I'm asking you for help to turn away from my sinful habits and my sinful ways. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.